President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed the law establishing the National Aeronautics and Space Administration on July 29, 1958. Less than 11 years later, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. President Obama signed the NASA Authorization Act on October 11, 2010. Among its provisions, the law called on NASA to create the Space Launch System rocket and have it ready to launch in 2016. Sounded reasonable, and in some sense, the SLS rocket was already built. The most challenging aspect of almost any launch vehicle is its engines. No problem, the SLS rocket would use engines left over from the Space Shuttle program. Its side-mounted booster would be a slightly larger version of those that powered the shuttle for three decades. The newest part of the vehicle would be its large core stage, housing liquid hydrogen and oxygen fuel tanks to feed the rocket's four main engines. But even this compartment was derivative. The core stage's 8.4-meter diameter was identical to the space shuttle's external tank, which carried the same propellants for the shuttle's main engines. Alas, construction wasn't that easy. NASA's SLS rocket program has been a hot mess almost from the beginning. Lawmakers have overlooked years of delay and more than doubling development cost over $20 billion. And now here we are nearly a dozen years after that authorization act was signed and NASA SLS is still on the ground. What a disaster. NASA began developing the SLS in 2011, just after the cancellation of its Constellation Moon program, which would have used an Ares rocket to send Orion to the International Space Station, the Moon, and eventually Mars. Back then, the development of the giant rocket was budgeted at $10 billion, with an expected debut voyage in late 2016. But development costs, budget issues, design changes, political hurdles, and other bumps in the road delayed the rocket's first launch to 2016, 17, then 18, 19, 20, 21, now 22, and in total, SLS has missed its opportunity to launch 24 times. Are you not entertained? Let's talk about an extensive list of FUBARD systems. First, the tank broke. Someone dropped an incredibly expensive tank dome, damaging it beyond repair. Of course, if this was a real production facility, it wouldn't be that hard to replace. But because everything's meticulously handcrafted by elves with nail files, this caused a major delay. Next, the welder broke. This one digs into the archives, but NASA spent months installing a new friction stir welding machine only to discover that some subcontractor hadn't reinforced the floor, causing the machine to break and need to be rebuilt from the ground up. Two years later, the welding machine broke again. The engines needed extra work. Despite 40 years of flight heritage, the once reusable SSMEs are still subject to a variety of technical issues and have never gotten close to the original certification criteria. In addition to that, Aerojet Rocketdyne, the engine contractor, had managed to charge more per engine for the second-hand engines that are already gathering dust in some warehouse than they cost to build in the first place. Between the fuel tank and the engine is the thrust structure plumbing. The SLS project managed to contaminate the plumbing with paraffin, and it wasn't detected until after the plumbing was completed. FOD in tanks and engines is surprisingly a common source of rocket crashes, such as the Antares, and for that reason, everyone knows to look out for it and take precautionary measure. For some reason, it takes a month to attach each engine to the rocket, maybe longer if it's done side-on. By comparison, a 737 spends just nine days on the assembly line. Oh, the software. Yes, the software. The process of developing flight software is a very serious endeavor, requiring experience and deep expertise to ensure that something like Ariane 5's first launch doesn't happen. Should we be worried, then, that the NASA OIG continues to report that the MSFC software team can't get their act together and that the SLS still doesn't have either a complete flight software stack of any kind or any integrated test environment? I think it's safe to assume, given how confused everyone was over the TVC parameters in the Green Run test failure, that the software is still in utter shambles. It's not well known anymore, but leading up to the first and much delayed shuttle launch in 1981, the entire software stack and test system had to be rewritten from scratch. Having endured hundreds of design changes, it was such a mess that tests couldn't even be reliably started. 
Ah, the booster test failed. Again, in these programs, the tests are admittance tests. They're specifically designed to be boring. Nothing in this 50-year-old tech stack is meant to break. And yet the mission-critical single point of failure thrust vectoring nozzle on a closely related solid motor failed for no apparent reason. If this happened on a shuttle or SLS flight, it's safe to assume the total loss of crew, payload, and vehicle. Solids have no engine-out capability. They have moderately common failure modes, which are apparently still not understood and still not corrected. It is safe to assume that the black swan failure rates of solids are around 1 in 100, which is nowhere near good enough for a modern rocket. A failure rate of 1 in 100 in any critical subsystem means that the overall system performance will never be better than that. Almost infinite levels of engineering effort can continue to be expended on solid boosters, but they'll never be reliable enough for any kind of commercial flight certification. Not even close. If we're talking about aircraft, we'd be talking about catastrophic structural failure and aircraft that occasionally shed wings cannot be certified. Scream it until their ears bleed. Solid boosted hydrogen first stages are architecturally unsafe. The political insistence that the shuttle and SLS use solid boosters means that no amount of time or money will ever make them safer than a 1 in 100 chance of catastrophic failure. Why spend infinite money on an obsolete system that has failure baked in? And finally, let's see how that billion dollar launch tower is going. NASA spent billions of dollars on upgrading the mobile launch tower, the big truss that sits next to the rocket on the launch pad. Unfortunately, it leans and will only be used for at most one flight. Tweaking an existing steel truss is not exactly rocket science. For the same price, you could have 20 Falcon launches. Because it would take three years? Why? I have no idea. To upgrade the launch tower for SLS Block 1B, instead they'll build another one for another billion dollars. More pitifully, in June of 2022, NASA OIG reports the second launch tower has already spent its budget before construction even started, while the contractor, Bechtel, has offered the usual excuses for their inability to construct a basic steel truss. Now, we really can't blame because space is hard. A lot's happened in space over this decade plus of SLS development, including the emergence of commercial cargo and commercial crew missions to the ISS, the introduction of reusable rockets by SpaceX, and an exponential buildup of new private space companies. In 2016, the same year that SLS was originally supposed to launch for the first time, SpaceX founder and CEO Elon Musk revealed the company's design for its next generation deep space transportation system a huge rocket spaceship combo known as Starship. So far, only a handful of the company's Starship prototypes have gotten off the ground, none of them on an orbital test flight, but a full-stack Starship orbital test flight is expected before the end of this year. If that mission is successful, SpaceX will have taken its super heavy lift vehicle from the drawing board and into space in far less time than it took NASA to do the same with SLS. Importantly, those who have focused on the space race this year between SLS and Starship have missed the point. The real question is not which of the two will launch first, rather it's how many Starships will launch between the first and second flights of the SLS rocket. Nominally, the second SLS mission is due to fly in 2024, but it'll probably slip into 2025. Conceivably, Starship could launch a dozen times between now and then, maybe even 30 times. After all, the best time to cancel SLS was 15 years ago. The second best time is now. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Hey, don't forget, share your ideas in the comment section right there below because your support motivates us to create more quality videos. And for that, we thank you very much and hope to see you next time.